things is not like the others taking you back to Sesame Street. Uh, and the three things were, um, I didn't actually put them on the title screen, but it was the fact that, you know, almost every Netflix show that you can watch now has some sort of queer character on it. Um, the Prime Minister regularly now marches in five parades. You know, you can play a couple years ago for the first time as Prime Minister. Halifax one last year. And, uh, and then at the same time, hate crimes against LGBTQ people are on the rise. And that doesn't quite seem to make sense. So that's, it, it's giving it away. It's, it's pretty simple. But what that's the thing that doesn't seem to fit with those other two. Uh, and so that's kind of where this research started, was to try and say, why is that happening? Why are seemingly paradoxical events occurring at the same time? So before I go through the slides, uh, there are just a few scenes or slides that might have graphic images uh, on them. It's just a bit of a warning, there's not too many. And, uh, and that's not one of them. <laughs> but uh, basically, the, the short version of the title for this talk or for the kind of the overall question of this research is how do people go from seeing something oh, it on autoplay? Uh, how do they go from seeing something like this to responding in a way that like leads them to cause something like this, to lash out at the people in those photos uh, just because they saw them displaying some form of affection with each other. It really is bottom line. Uh, <laughs> just make sure. I don't know why. It's okay. We'll keep the traps on. So, um, so I kind of gave this away a little bit. In the context of the last decade or so, we've seen an increase in LGBTQ civil rights, not just in Canada, uh, but across North America and even really across the globe, right? Most recently, Australia legalized same sex marriage. There was recently a declaration like this week that uh, many Latin American countries will now have to legalize same sex marriage. Any Gallup poll or large national poll has shown a reduction in sexual prejudice. So, homophobia, homonegativity, they see that going down at the same time. That kind of makes sense. But then we see this violence going up. We see increased anti-gay hate crimes. In Canada, uh, now we have a census back. It's wonderful. We get to know about this type of stuff. Things. But one of the things that came out recently from Stats Canada was that uh, sexual orientation is the most common group that is identified when it's a hate crime in Canada. Uh, so that and that they are on the rise and have been over the last, you know, basically a decade. It doesn't quite make sense. And Lee's is saying why. These things don't seem to go together. And my suggestion is that perhaps one of the things that might be playing into this would be an increase in same-sex public displays of affection at the same time, right? So if suddenly you have rights, if you can get married, if your parents are willing to pay for your wedding too, you know, like the, the attitudes are coming around all over, then you're probably suddenly going to feel a little bit more comfortable actually expressing that affection in public in front of other people. So it might be, but that means people are also seeing it more. And it, those, perhaps some people who are very persistent, is the word I use, who are persistent in their sexual prejudice, when they see that, perhaps it's acting as an instigator or a catalyst uh, and causing them to lash out. And so to kind of back up what I'm saying about this increase, uh, 2013 is really when they really began to kind of notice this uptick uh, there was a spat of anti-gay hate crimes in New York, and they were especially in, like, in New York City, uh, in some of the most queer-friendly areas of the city. Uh, and and they, so they noticed this, and the other thing that seemed to be happening is, it was only anecdotal, but they seemed to be precipitated by same-sex couples holding hands, kissing, uh, something to that effect, and it was couples who were being attacked. It wasn't just picking out one person and running after them, it was something about the couple and the affection that seemed to be drawing these responses out. There was another uptick, uh, again, in those types of incidents after the 2015 marriage rule in the United States. The Supreme Court came out and said, no, this has to be a federal thing. You have to legalize it federally. And there was kind of this backlash response uh, and another uptick in that violence at that time. That's what I'm calling persistent sexual prejudice. That, that it's going up, that this prejudice is sticking when it doesn't make sense. Nothing else that points towards it says that this should be sticking around or increasing at this time. And so it's obviously going to be a smaller segment of the population. 
Because when we do a national poll or a survey, we see that on average, the sexual prejudice is going down. People are more accepting. By and far, many, many people are more accepting. Um, and yet this small group is holding on to that prejudice despite really telling them not to. Right? It's now it's no longer cool to be homophobic, right? You, you keep that stuff to yourself. And even the most staunch, uh, staunchly prejudiced people, people seem to have a sense that they can't quite share that feeling as openly as they may be used to. Uh, and so they're going against norms by actually continuing to be this prejudice, so prejudiced that they'll actually act out and be violent. And so that's my question is, can we try to somehow identify that are persistent in their sexual prejudice against all other indicators saying that that's really not the way society's headed? And are they perhaps violent? And if so, could that help us to explain this increase in violence at a time when it doesn't seem to make sense? Looking at traditional uh, predictors of homo negativity, we know a lot about it. It's been studied for many decades. Uh, men tend to be higher in levels of homo negativity. They tend to have, if you're higher in homo negativity, your education tends to be lower. Uh, you tend not to have contact. So, you know, one of the things is called the contact hypothesis that if we can just get people to know gay people, then prejudice will go down. And to some extent, that does help and that does work. Uh, so again, people who are higher have less contact, uh, and we've also seen lower abstract reasoning skills and kind of kind of black and white rigid thinking among people who might be higher in homo negativity. Uh, in addition to those kinds of predictors, there's also some world views, just ways of understanding and looking at the world around you that are associated with homo negativity and really with prejudice in general. Uh, one of them is called social dominance orientation, and this is basically just this feeling that. It's natural for the world to have a hierarchy, and that some people will be higher uh, in, in, in that hierarchy than others, and that that's okay, that we feel that that's the way it should be, that you kind of accept the fact that there's always going to be minorities that are not doing as well, and you're okay with that. So the more that you accept that, that you think that that's the way the world would be, then you're saying you know, high <coughs> social dominance orientation is the way the world should function. Um, Right-wing authoritarianism is another kind of worldview that leads into prejudice and homonegativity. Uh, so the belief that, you know, we should follow legitimate authorities, that you need to have authority for a uh, society to function, and then not only do you need to follow authority, but that anyone who doesn't follow authority should be punished, and swiftly and, you know, as effectively as possible, possibly, you know, violently, not crime-type violently, but like corporal punishment type right? uh, violently. Both of these really lead to an us versus them worldview, right? That there's us on our side, that we're either high in the hierarchy, or that we are the authority, or that we're at least helping the authority to uh, share their views and whatnot. That's kind of, it summarizes it up into us versus them very easily. But my question is, is that enough to really generate values? <coughs> if you're listening to those descriptions, there's probably somebody in your life that you can think of that maybe fits both of those. You know, thinks authority is a pretty good thing. That maybe thinks that, you know, yeah, there's a natural hierarchy. If you don't agree with them, that's okay, but they're still a nice person. Maybe they're your dad. You're not, you're not too torn up about it. So for me, to then say that those things might be predicting these hate crimes could be pretty uncomfortable. Um, and so to me, I don't think that's enough. I think that maybe there's more necessary to take this to uh, violence. And so, um, what is it then that can take them to a violent outburst? It can take them from having attitudes like that, but to actually reacting to seeing a same-sex couple being happy and responding in a way with, with violence. And I have three potential suggestions that I think play a role. Obviously, I'm going to give you the answer to. Anyway, uh, the first is narcissism. The second is something that I call personalization of prejudice. And the third is femophobia. And I'm going to tell you about all three of these uh, as we go through, and then I'm going to show you some of the research that I've done to try and see whether or not these are associated with the violence. So narcissism. Uh, it's associated with violence in multiple contexts. I'm not the first person to say that narcissism might be linked to the violence. That's definitely not me. Um, in fact, we know that people who are narcissists, they really have you know, back to that worldview thing, they believe that their worldview is the worldview everyone should subscribe to, to the point that they're even willing to defend that worldview violently. 
um, and that they'll take any type of straying from that worldview almost as a, they take it personally, right? Because it's about them. Uh, so they have an inflated sense of entitlement, which means that not only do they think that you should punish um, deviations from what they view as being the proper way of doing things, but they think they have the right to do so. That they are personally the one who is entitled to let you know that you've crossed the line, or that you're, you're coloring outside of the lines. So they feel that that's their right to do that. We also know that people who are high in narcissism lack empathy. Uh, and empathy is, you know, when you lack empathy, then you can't understand the harm that you're causing to others, right? You can't understand the pleasure that they're experiencing, perhaps, when they're sharing affection, and at the same time, you cannot fully understand the harm or pain that you can cause them. Uh, and so as a result, you know, that could very well uh, make violence more likely. And finally, narcissists are very much likely to attack other groups. Um, and to, uh, especially those, like I've said, that kind of are an affront to their uh, worldview. When you put narcissistic entitlement and homonegativity together, this is where I thought the narcissism and violence of Tsunami, you know, as a bunch of other psychologists for many, many decades. Um, this is where I thought I was getting onto something that was going to be neat. It turns out it wasn't. Um, so there is a study that put these things together before I did. Uh, and it was a dissertation at the University of Texas, and he looked at narcissistic entitlement uh, predicting aggressive behaviors towards gay men, and found that, uh, it really, that it was that if you didn't have that narcissism piece, then there was not uh, as much violence towards gay men. So if you were higher in narcissism, and especially in that entitlement aspect of narcissism, you were more likely to report uh, having been violent towards gay men. There was one other person who also kind of knocked on the same door, uh, and it, it's like in terms of psychoanalysis, uh, and, and reported many case studies of something that he called narcissistic homophobia. And basically, the way he put it is that they see themselves as the standard to which the rest of the world should live up to heterosexual, then that's one piece of that standard, and you can't deviate from that. So it's like, you know, the world in their image uh, that's been created. So when you put those two together, narcissism plus prejudice, you get to what then I call personalization of prejudice. And I'm going to try to walk you through uh, what this idea means to me, and because uh, you'll need to understand it in order to understand the, the results that I give you. But in sum, it's basically saying that your prejudice, whatever prejudice you have, that it's all about you. It's not really about other people, it's about you. Your prejudice is coming from your definition of normal. And so if someone strays from your definition, you don't like that and you're prejudiced towards them. It's about your personal attractions and preferences. So if you are heterosexual, uh, then you don't understand why somebody else wouldn't be because you're putting yourself out there in that prejudice. Uh, ideas like, I don't like it, then nobody should, if it's not okay for me, it's not okay for them. Those kinds of connotations kind of explain it. But I have a better way to, to walk you through uh, understanding how this might happen uh, on the street. <laughs> you guys know this guy? <laughs> Thanks. So just picture, picture your friendly neighborhood narcissist <laughs> down the street. I'll tell you, it's very hard to find a picture of him walking, but <laughs> I found one. And you know, you're walking, and maybe you're walking in New York, and you come across a same sex couple, and you see them. And this is what I see as happening in the mind of someone who is experiencing personalization of prejudice. They see that because they really put themselves into that position. They personalize what they're seeing to the extent that it's as though they are there, right? And they are engaged in whatever that activity is that they're witnessing, and they don't like how that feels because that's not the same as dodging a kiss from Melania. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and his face changes, right? And he doesn't like that because it's not the same. Putting himself there. He can't see past the fact that this is a very cute looking happy couple uh, just you know expressing their love the same way that he wants to uh, express his love. He can't see that connection, that lack of empathy there. And instead, he can only feel what he would feel if he was in that moment. And you can imagine how that would be a bit of a knee-jerk reaction then, if that's something you personally don't want to do. Uh, and so it leads to that kind of 
disgust feeling. So the thoughts that might go along with that include things like, what bothers me most about being men is what they do sexually. Right? So that it's like, it's something really about what they're doing. That's what bugs me. I wouldn't want to do that, and so it really doesn't make me feel too good. Um, the thought of having sex with another man physically repulses me. Right? So again, that this prejudice somehow has something to do with it. We don't care what you're physically repulsed by. Like, we're talking about two other men over here who want to have sex with each other. They haven't invited you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the kind of sense that you're having when you think of that. Like, oh, that's gross. It repulses me. Um, I'd be very upset if another man hit on me. Right? Yeah, and that's one that we see a lot. Like, oh, I don't want to go to the gay bar. Somebody might hit on me. And you're kind of like, you know. Maybe you're not all that, but <laughs> maybe nobody will hit on you. Um, and, and so that idea that that would be very upsetting to you if that were to happen to you. And, you know, I mean, what do you do when somebody else hits on you that you don't want to, to be with, right? You politely decline. You lie about already having a partner. You go start dancing with somebody else who isn't your partner. You, you have many, many coping skills for getting out from under the person who's hitting on you. But suddenly, when it's a gay man hitting on a straight man, it switches up and it's okay to just punch him out because you have to defend one, and that that one's not okay. And so it's kind of just not taking that live and let live perspective. There's something there, perhaps, with blocking that ability to do that. So that's my notion of personalization of prejudice. That's what I mean when I say that somebody's high in personalization of prejudice. Those are the kind of thoughts that they're having when they see couples or just that they have in general when they think about same-sex couples. The next element or the third element that I think may play a role, and really it's where my wife who thinks may play a role, who, um, and now I think so as well. Um, so we do our research together and that they tend to blend. But you have to give credit where credit's due or else you can't go home. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this comes from Fem Theory, and uh, which is basically, I'm going to jump down and pass you kind of off of me, but um, it's essentially this idea that society in general devalues anything that we see as feminine. We devalue tons of things that we see as feminine, you put that as the lower, right? The word effeminacy means that you are, you're dropping down into feminacy, right? You've lost that high bar of masculinity and you've somehow dropped. And you can see this in many different places. Um, and so, the part that we're seeing here, though, that might be linked to the violence that we're suggesting might be, is that people seem to get upset when femininity is misplaced in any way. That there are these confines around how you can be feminine, right? And that you have a broader range of options of how you can be masculine than you do around how you can be feminine, right? If you're too feminine, if your skirt's too short, you have too much makeup, uh, or you're too, you know, flimsy or anything like that, you're criticized. You're too feminine, right? There was some research out recently that said the more feminine a scientist looks, the more beautiful and feminine a scientist looks, the less other researchers are to believe their research. Right? So we see this in many different areas. Um, but and if you stray the other way, uh, and you are, you know, if you put femininity into the wrong places, like a man who is too feminine, we don't like that either, right? So we're very careful about who can be feminine, how you can be feminine, and we get upset when people really kind of stray from that. So what I'm just saying here is that misplaced femininity, just picking up on something that you deem to be, that's not where femininity belongs, uh, might play another role here in predicting uh, violence towards uh, gay men, and especially any gay man who might also then seem feminine as well that feminine men are gay, and that's part of feminine theory as well, that the two do not equate to one another. But that that, when that is sensed, might be a precipitator for violence. Um, the other part of that that kind of ties in is that just making a man the object of another man's desire in our world at present already lends some amount of femininity to him, right? You could think of your most masculine favorite football player Soon as he becomes the object of desire of another man, there's something feminine about that that we see. Uh, because we've just taken for granted that men desire femininity. Uh, and so if they're desiring that in another man, it's not quite right, it's not quite what we're expecting. 
So uh, to um, measure this, we tried to measure something that we're calling femphobia, fem negativity, which would be the extent to which you might view femininity yourself as being a negative thing. How much are you devaluing femininity? Uh, and just some of the items that kind of were used to measure this are things like IT demand because of this feminine appearance, uh, men who cross dress for pleasure disgust me, uh, men who act like women should be ashamed of themselves, men who shave their legs are weird, a man who dresses as a woman is a pervert, feminine boys should be cured of their problems, uh, passive men are weak, feminine men make me uncomfortable, uh, and so on. And, and it's just those are kind of a collection of different items that come up. Um, okay, I'm having one of those moments where I'm thinking of something. I don't know if this was from Grey's Anatomy last night <laughs> or something, but it was something about someone talking. Oh, yeah, it was. It was Grey's Anatomy. So, so Ashley didn't watch Grey's Anatomy from the beginning. So we had to go back to the time. <laughs> so we just, you know, we, we made it up to 2013 or something. No, 2009. We're at 2009. Classic <laughs> <laughs> Grey's Anatomy. Anyways. Uh, Izzy was fantasizing about the future child she was going to have, and she said, she's like, you know, oh, I think we're going to have a daughter, you know, she's going to be a cute tomboy, and uh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Can you imagine the same sentence? It's like, we're going to have a boy, he's going to be this wonderful little sissy boy. <laughs> we don't see that, right? That doesn't come out. You can fantasize about a tomboy daughter, but not a sissy boy son, right? You might, maybe you're at the point where you're accepting of a sissy boy son, but you're not hoping for one yet. And so that, again, would be femphobia. And that idea that, you know, it's okay that tomboys are cool, sissy boys not so much. That's just how my brain works sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so putting this all together. It's a bit like a puzzle. We have our narcissistic entitlement, uh, personalization of prejudice, and same-sex PDAs. And I all come together then and predict uh, violence and aggression towards gay men. And I have femphobia floating around in the side because I'm wondering where might that fit uh, in all of this. And so the research that I did to do this uh, was part of my postdoc at the University of Utah. Um, yeah, I, I won't tell you how I got there. It's just part of my research at the University of Utah. And, uh, and so, you know, we recruited widely to get participants into study and uh, we ended up with a sample of 465 participants who did the online survey. So some of the data I'm going to talk to you about today is from that large sample that's survey data only. And then we had a smaller sample, 140 of them come into the lab to actually do a fairly intensive in-lab experiment study. Um, and so some of the data is also from that as well, where we have a smaller sample because we had to pay them. Um, and so on average, they're about 27 years old. They have about 16 years of education. Uh, they're very American, they're relatively uh, religious, and because they were, the, for the larger survey sample, they're not all from Utah, but for the ones that could come into the lab, they had to be from Utah. So that does increase the level of religiousness. Um, in terms of the uh, initial online survey, we asked a bunch of different things like uh, demographics, we measured that narcissism, we measured the personalization uh, of prejudice, we measured femphobia and different aspects. We also asked them how violent they've been in the past. So keep in mind here that whenever I'm telling you about violence towards gay men, this is self-reported. This is what people admitted to, right? So you have to, you know, adjust that for what might actually be reality. We also had the men come into the lab, the smaller sample, uh, where they took some more attitude measures and they watched six slideshows uh, of different images. And while they did that, we collected a, a bunch of different data, some physio data that I'll talk about, uh, and also just some self-report data. So these are those slideshows. They basically saw five or uh, five minutes of photos of each type of this photo. So different photos for five minutes, flipping curve. So we just have the same sex uh, and mixed sex couples either kissing or not kissing, so engaged in some other kind of PDA. Uh, and then we had boring things like paper clips and rocks that they had to watch for five minutes. Um, <laughs> and then I'm sparing you the disgusting images. Uh, but they also had to see some disgusting images that were really, really quite disgusting. Uh, and so that's why I'm not making them look happy. Anyways, uh, so yeah, the, uh, what I'm mostly going to talk about then is the data that comes from that earlier online survey, as well as the in lab visit and some of the data that comes from there. This is still ongoing. So, um, Bree left out conveniently that some of this is what she used for her honors thesis data. 
I have another student doing an honors thesis on this data again this year. Um, and there's more for next year, so <laughs> we'll just keep going. Um, so the research questions that I can address so far anyways, the first one is, does the link between narcissistic entitlement and aggression towards gay men, does that depend on whether or not uh, someone's sexual prejudice is personalized? Does that weaken if somebody is not personalizing their prejudice? Does narcissism alone, is that enough to predict violence, or do they need to have that personalization element in there too? The question is, do individuals who are high in personalizing their sexual prejudice uh, do they respond differently when they see same-sex public displays of affection? So are we, is this the right population? If people are personalizing their prejudice, might they be the ones that we're looking to to explain that uptick in violence uh, in one way? So again, uh, self-report of violence, but also we uh, measured the salivary alpha analytes, which is, they just had to drool a lot um, while they watched those examples. And then third question is, does femphobia add anything to our ability to predict aggression towards gay men over and above many of those traditional predictors that I already talked about at the beginning? Other predictors than social dominance, orientation, and right-wing authoritarianism, uh, narcissism, where does it fit in? Can it predict violence uh, as well? And so those are the three questions. The first question then uh, is this link is whether or not this link between narcissism and aggression uh, is moderated by uh, personalization of prejudice. So here's what I'm just looking at a picture format. The pictures are always better. So we already know from that lovely man in Texas that um, who did a dissertation and he robbed me of every noise. We already know that narcissistic entitlement is, is predicts aggressive behavior towards gay men specifically, right? Not just aggression, but towards gay men. We know that that's uh, you know, we're going to rep see if we replicate that, but more or less we can trust that that might be in the data. What we're asking then is whether or not being high in personalization of that prejudice somehow changes that relationship. Does it change it in some way if you were high in personalization? And does it show up a different way if you were low in personalization? That's what's being asked by this question. And so um, along the bottom here, you're going to see narcissistic entitlement, and along the side, you're going to see aggressive behavior uh, that they self-reported in, uh, in the survey. And people who are high in personalization are going to be the blue line, and people who are low in personalization are going to be the green line. So green line, low personalization, that's live and let live. And the high is, you know, like, I don't, I don't want to do it, so I don't see why anyone else does. And you see our blue line. So our high personalization of prejudice, the more narcissistic they are, especially in the entitlement aspect, the higher their uh, self-reported aggressive behavior towards gay men. It's just, it's, it's a beautiful line, right? It's just going, it's just beautiful. <laughs> so when you have a low personalization of prejudice, that relationship entirely disappears. It, it's, it's gone. It's, you know, you can't say that it's going down. It's, it's just, it's, it's gone. Uh, and, and it's not predictive anymore. And so it only, that narcissistic entitlement only predicts aggression towards gay men if you are also high in personalizing that prejudice. So you can think all that you want of yourself and kind of be just, you know, your average narcissist. That's not enough unless you're also really taking it to that extra step and personalizing your prejudice and kind of twisting that narcissism onto your prejudice uh, specifically. And what's interesting is that the sample definitely has people who are high in narcissism but who are not high uh, in personalization. So we do see that differentiation. It can be one without being the other, uh, and they are separate ideas. So research question one, the answer is yes. If that does change the relationship, uh, it moderates the relationship between the two variables. Second question is, does being high in that personalization of prejudice change the way that you witness or respond to same-sex public displays of affection? Um, so first we have the self-report responses. So while they watched these slideshows, uh, in between each one they answered a bunch of questions. Uh, and then the next slideshow would begin and they'd go again. The uh, salad, you know, you know rule when you think about salad very um, It's true. Uh, anyways, so then what they did is they drooled into tubes before and after each slideshow. Uh, and what's neat about salivary alpha is it responds rather quickly. Uh, so cortisol takes 20 minutes to respond, uh, but salivary alpha amylase can hit its peak in response within five minutes. 
Uh, so it makes it uh, a, you know, a useful measure for pre and post uh, situations like this. So again, they saw these types of slideshows, five minutes each, surveys in between, uh, and some you know, physiological data being collected as, as they went as well. And these were the self-report kind of that they answered each time. They, uh, this is just actually a handful of them. So things like these photos were discussing how much do you agree or disagree with that. Um, these photos were romantic. I could relate to the people in these photos. I felt happy for the people. If my friend put this photo on Facebook, I would like it. Uh, and uh, these people in the photo looked very happy. So those are the ones we're going to go through now. I'm going to show you what, uh, how people high in personalization prejudice and how people low in personalization prejudice respond to each of these based on each of the different slide charts. So the first one is these photos were romantic. How much do people agree with that statement? Uh, along the bottom, you're going to see whether or not they're high or low in personalization. And along this side, you see their agreement with this statement. So up higher is more agreement that they are romantic photos. Uh, and then these are the kind of the short form. So SSK means same-sex kissing, and MSK means mixed-sex kissing. The P, SSP means PDA without kissing. So the, the holding hands photos, black, uh, disgusting, and green, boring things. So those are the boring things with the paper clips, the rocks, so on and so forth. So uh, for mixed-sex couples, people low and high in personalization of prejudice. Yes, these photos are romantic. Or not, both of them are up high. You can barely even see that yellow line. But then, when we get to the same sex PDA photos, we see that those who are high in personalization of prejudice take a nose dive there on the front track. They can no longer see these photos as being uh, romantic. And in fact, their average for the whole group is below the midpoint of the scale. They're into the disagreeing area of the scale. They disagree that these are romantic images. Basically, the same pattern whether they're kissing or uh, not kissing. Boring things are not romantic, and neither are disgusting things. So just in case you were wondering, um, that's, that's what that one. So now I'll go through these next ones a little bit faster because now you kind of understand what the graph shows and what it means. But the next one is these photos were disgusting, so kind of uh, rating the opposite. And so again, right away you see, yes, they did agree that our photos were very disgusting. Everybody found them disgusting, and they truly, truly are. Uh, no difference there. Um, but then when you get to the same sex kissing and same sex PDA, you see again that those who are high in personalization are more likely to say that these photos are disgusting. People who are low in personalization are not finding the photos disgusting. And maybe they're our live and let live group, right? They're not taking it that same personal way. Um, and then everybody else, nobody is really finding uh, the, the mixed sex couples kissing uh, or PDA to be disgusting, the boring things are not disgusting either. Uh, and there's, really, there's not a significant difference, even though these are kind of laid out like this, uh, those differences aren't different between uh, the different slideshows in your book. The next one was, I could relate to these people. And this one's important because it kind of gets at that empathy idea, right? Can you even relate to these people? You don't have to want to be friends with them or anything else. Can you relate to whatever they're doing in those photos? And so for the mixed sex couples, yeah, people could relate fairly well. Um, in fact, you see a little bit higher, but it's not significantly higher uh, for the mixed sex couples. But we see the opposite pattern when it's the same sex couples. So they cannot, people high in personalization can't relate to what they're seeing. And in fact, that's even lower than their average rating for um, whether or not the photos were romantic. Right? They're, they're, they're even lower than that. And what's really interesting, or what gets me of this one, is that the disgusting and boring images are ranked higher by those high in personalization uh, than the images of two men kissing or holding hands. So they can relate more to the disgusting images than the boring images. And I'll give them the boring images, right? We can all relate to a paper clip because she uses them. Uh, and you know, there's coffee mugs and different things. Like if you could relate to the items, I'll give them that. The disgusting images, I don't know what type of life experiences they've had. I didn't ask really, but like, I don't like. There were open wounds, there were like bones protruding. You, know, you could relate to some of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, largely, uh, most people I would hope could not have related to many. There was snake but there was all a bunch of different things. Uh, maggots throwing out of heads, and like, you can't, you have to look at these photos really quickly when you go through. It's just awful. Um, and so that was kind of interesting. They could relate more to some of these very awful photos than they could 
the two men holding out and two men at the side. Um, I felt happy for these people in the photos. Same pattern again, where we're not happy, where we can't even be happy for the people that we're high in personalization, but again, not having any issue if we're low in personalization. Um, and I would like this on Facebook. So if you just come to my Faculty of Arts talk um, last year, you know that the other thing I study is social support for relationships. And if your friends and family support your relationship, does your relationship do better? And the short answer to that whole talk is yes, um, it does. And so in this kind of technology world we live in now, a like on Facebook is essentially a form of social support. If you put your engagement photos up and nobody likes them, that's going to give you a bit of a message about how your friends and family view your relationship. And in fact, you know, like, uh, I have people telling me that you have to post at certain times of the day to maximize the number of likes you get. If you don't get enough likes, you need to delete that photo, right? These likes, they matter. They're a currency of type. Um, if people put up mixed sex photos, they're, they're going to like them if their friends do that. They're not going to like the disgusting or the boring images, so don't go filling your Facebook with rocks and paper clips. <laughs> get you more likes. Um, and then here, you see this extreme difference between the high and low personalization again, that if you are high in personalization, you're going to withhold that like. Right? You're not even going to go so far as to click a button to say like. Now this is this data was collected before Facebook had the multiple options of emotions. So I don't know if they would be willing to click you know, the angry button or <laughs> anything else. But at this time, you know, they are just not liking it. Uh, and they won't give it that like. So I, I find that really interesting. And then finally, this is to make you feel better a little bit. Um, these people in these photos were very much in love. So the first thing I'll draw your attention to is that the scale has changed. We're only looking at the data between four and five because that's where the averages fell. Uh, and so there is still a difference and it is still significant, but even our high personalization of prejudiced people are falling above the midpoint of the scale. So they are agreeing. People look like they're in love, they're just not agreeing quite as enthusiastically as the people low in personalization of prejudice. So that is kind of that I draw attention to this stuff. So research question number two then, does personalization of prejudice change how people respond? It would appear yes, that, that, that um, there seems to be a bit of a difference in how they are rating those photos. Their self-report ratings seem to be different uh, based on whether they're high or low in personalization. So thus far, going back to our puzzle, um, we see that narcissistic entitlement does predict uh, violence towards gay men, but only when personalization of prejudice is high. When personalization of prejudice is not there, that, that link disappears. When personalization is low, then you can be as narcissistic as you want, and it doesn't seem to be associated with violence towards gay men. So that's the first part there uh, to kind of look at it. The second part of this research question then is the salivary alpha amylase and whether or not we can actually detect a physiological response to these photos uh, instead of just a self-report response. Uh, we had 120 of those initial 140 who were good droolers um, and so we did lose a few who were not good droolers um, and uh, we were able to out. So this next section is, is Brianna's thesis. Um, and so salivary alpha amylase, what is it? Is it the digestive en uh, enzyme? It's uh, associated with the feeling of wanting to escape the situation that you're in. You don't really want to, you want to escape it. You want to kind of be leaving it. So it's a little bit of a stress thing, but it, it's not as clear cut and dry um, as, you know. Uh, what we were expecting to see, or hoping to see, well, it's, it's tricky with this research, right? Because you don't really hope if you don't want to see bad things, and then you want to see this, it's, it's complicated. Um, you know, you get really mixed emotions. The good, the good of this type of research, though, if you're looking for a research area, is that often, like, when you don't find what you thought you were going to look for, it's usually good news. Uh, so, you know, it can go either way that way. But anyways, we were wondering whether or not we would see higher levels of salivary alpha amylase among those who are high in personalization of prejudice whether or not they might be wanting to escape that situation more than others. We also thought maybe it would be related to other measures of sexual prejudice or homophobia and whatnot. Would they have a higher, you know, a greater salivary response, a salivary alpha response? That's what we were kind of thinking that we wanted to look at. That's what both Brianna's 
you know, proposal said that we were going to look at. And then none of that really turned out at all. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, there was no difference uh, in any of the salivary L families by any of those different prejudice types. You couldn't say high, low prejudice and then see a difference in their average uh, salivary L families. You couldn't see anything until you looked at the sample all together and only looked at the differences between the slideshows. So this has nothing to do with people's attitudes or prejudices. This is everybody in the sample. We're going from people who have very low prejudice up to people who have very high, people who are not narcissistic to people who are, people who uh, are low and high in personalization prejudice, all in this same sample. And we're just comparing between the slideshows themselves. So the same code along the bottom. And what we see here is we're comparing each one, each salivary alpha family's average to the average for the neutral slideshow. So for the um, looking at the boring things is what we're calling the neutral slideshow. And what we see here is that people on average had a higher salivary alpha amylase response uh, compared to the neutral figures when they were looking at the same sex kissing photos. Sense perhaps, if, if that's what it means, uh, of wanting to escape. Um, or perhaps some indicator of stress um, is higher when, they're, when we're looking at the same sex kissing versus the neutral. Uh, it was also higher than the, looking at the mixed sex PDAs, so they were higher than that one as well. Um, and they were trending, you know, statistical significance, they were trending on being higher than the mixed sex kissing. Um, and then the next one, this green line here, is showing the comparison between the disgust and the neutral. And so the disgust was also higher. Seeing disgusting images that you obviously probably don't want to be around either also elicited a greater physiological response than the neutral slideshows and the paper clips and the rocks and so on and so forth. But then there was no difference between the disgusting and the same sex kissing uh, photos. And so th this was a bit of a quandary for us to deal with because, you know, it's not as clean cut and dry where you can say, okay, all these people that have these, these lovely prejudices and their personalization issues and everything else. They're having an issue. This data didn't help us with that because this is describing everybody in the sample. It could be a small sample size issue and so on and so forth, but in general, we're seeing it across the sample. And so it was contrary to our hypothesis. It wasn't what we were expecting. Personalization of prejudice makes no difference here. None of the prejudices make any difference here. Um, and instead, it's for everybody. And that threw us for a bit of a loop because we're like, oh, great. Like, that means we're all trying to escape this. Does this mean that it was hardwired into us? That's and we're like the media's gonna. That's not gonna go well. <laughs> and it's, it hasn't. You know, that Brianna's, Brianna's thesis was published um, about like a week after she graduated, and it was picked up by the media, and they did really not understand it very well. Um, so there are some articles out there that. <laughs> um, because they don't get quite yet. So what do we make of this then, right? Um, and how can we help people to understand this? The one is, are we just supposed to be discussing by 2D and kissing? And this was kind of where some of those media articles uh, went, uh, went to right away. Is that, see, it's natural, right? You're salivating, salivating is natural, and they're having the same response to disgusting images as they are to have seen gay two gay man kissing. Evolution is supposed to protect you from dangerous things. So th this must be a sign that gay men are dangerous and, and you need to just you know get out of there. Terrible damage. Uh, we don't think that's it. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, the next one is is it a socialized discussion response? And this is what we were thinking next is that perhaps you know you have decades, centuries have raised people to view homosexuality as disgusting, to view same-sex sexuality um, as perverted. And, and it takes a long time for that type of socialization to wear off, right? If you ever have experienced, I don't know, I don't think students here would have experienced this, but for instance, if you, um, I don't know, if you went out drinking one night and you got a little too drunk, and then you maybe went and had an egg like muffin or something, and then uh, you got sick to your stomach, and then you haven't eaten an egg with muffin since. <laughs> right? You learned, you made that pairing that that doesn't, you know, you've made, you can learn that disgust response. Now, I mean, maybe evolution should tell us that egg with muffins are disgusting. But anyways, right, you can learn those types of responses, and that's basically what that's saying, is that 
perhaps it just takes a lot longer for these types of socialized responses to, to leave us. And so perhaps that's why we can see people high in prejudice and low in prejudice experience the same. Some have cognitively overcome that, and others perhaps have not. That's one another possible explanation. The explanation that I actually prefer uh, of the three is that maybe that's a bit of an expected response. This is a sample of heterosexual men. Or it's heterosexual men in Utah, uh, you know, for what you might read into that. Um, and I don't expect them to be aroused by photos of other men kissing. I don't expect them to want to kiss other men. We didn't, we screened our participants for, uh, so we, you know, like anyone who was showing any indication, like they said, you know, like, I'm straight, but you know, maybe kind of gay. They weren't in this sample, right? We were one of the people who were pretty hardcore straight. And so I, just to remove contacts, but um, you know, I don't expect them to want to date other men. And in fact, I kind of understand if they feel a little queasy at the idea of kissing another man. I feel a little queasy at the idea of kissing another man. <laughs> that, that just doesn't, you know? And so I can relate to that. And so I don't, what it could very well be is that this is just indicating a response that you would have to seeing something that you would not want to be in that situation. You don't want to do that. Um, it's not something for you. And so perhaps that is just creating that you know, anxiety response. Another one that we don't have up here is also just this idea that perhaps it was just novel and new and taboo, and you know, that could also create that idea that you want to escape uh, that feeling. So as interesting as that kind of our findings were there, and it's also important to know that you know, we, we couldn't find anything from the group differences because the sample size did kind of drop there. So it really would need more. Uh, work done to really dig into that, but it was an interesting kind of preliminary uh, venture into trying to tie some physiological responses to uh, what they were witnessing. So uh, this is kind of summarizing what I just said, right? That people do not uh, necessarily, that, this was the other kind of part that I, I kind of see for explaining our, our findings is that that sample included everybody, right? It included the people who were high in aggression and the people who were low. So there's this thing called the gay panic defense. And it's used in courts, and it is actually, it's only outlawed, or like not allowed in court in the United States, in, in two states, I believe. It's not allowed. And the rest of it is still allowed to be used. And it's essentially, if you um, are a straight man, and you see a gay man, and you beat him up, or you kill him, in a fit of rage, you can claim they can. I freaked out, I, I'm not gay, I'm straight, I was worried he was gonna hit on me, I didn't know what to do, I just panicked, and before I knew it, I had beaten this guy up and he was dead, and it's not my fault I panicked, right? That's the, that's the defense. It was used in the Matthew Shepard case, it wasn't used successfully in the case, but they did allow it to be heard. Um, but basically, our findings do kind of take a knock out of that one. Because if, what they're saying is that sounds pretty physiological. That sounds like it's out of your control. Like something overcomes you when you see a same-sex couple or a same-sex couple kissing, but you're just overwhelmed to the point of a violent fit of rage that you can't be held responsible for. But we have men in this sample who are low in violence towards gay men and high, and yet they're all having the same salivary response. Some of them, violently, in fact, a very small number of them are lashing out violently. So obviously, if that's something that's in us that's just so hardwired, it doesn't seem like a very good indicator, right? It's, it's not taking over everybody. It's only, you know, so it's unlikely to be the, the causal factor in the few who are being violent. So that's kind of just another way that we looked at the findings uh, for that one. So uh, it doesn't really equal, we don't see the, the link there for trying to say that you know, this is such a physiological response that it could be driving the violence that we're seeing. We don't really see that as being explanatory. But then there's our third possible piece of the puzzle, which is femphobia and femnegativity. And could this possibly be related to predicting violence? And this allows us to go back and look at that full survey sample again. Uh, and have a larger sample because there, we're just for, we're using the data from the survey where we asked, you know, have you been violent towards gay men? And this is also where we have the question about how they use femininity and whether or not they have femphobic views. So, 
Again, our traditional predictors of home negativity, right, authoritarianism, religious orientation, lower education, uh, social dominance orientation, Protestant work ethic, uh, these are all different things that predict being violent or having, uh, they predict home negativity, they predict having a negative view towards gay men, and in some cases might be associated with violence. But we don't really see them being, you know, sufficient for the violence that we're talking about here. It doesn't seem to, to really mix together. Uh, especially to see, you know, when you see home negativity and related attitudes going down and violence going up, it really doesn't seem to pass. So could femphobia then maybe come in and explain some of this for us? So what we did was a binary logistic regression, which basically just means that we have split uh, the sample into two, you know, saying these people have been violent towards gay men, these people have not been violent towards gay men. Can we look at all of their attitudes on different measures and try to predict accurately which pot they are actually in? Can we predict where they landed into the future? We're predicting within the, the sample that we already have from what they've already told us. And so we first look at kind of um, our original uh, predictors. We have social dominance orientation, modern homonegativity, and old-fashioned homophobia. When these are included, Alongside narcissistic entitlement, personalization of prejudice, and phobia, they're no longer predictive of determining which group you fall in, the violent group or the non-violent group. These are some of the best and most reliable predictors from the literature uh, for this kind of thing going back in time, and none of them are working when they are in alongside narcissistic, narcissistic entitlement, which is working, which is also working alongside personalization of prejudice, and is also working with phobia. So the more that you devalue femininity in general, especially in terms of being upset by displaced femininity, femininity on men in particular, uh, the more likely you are to report having been violent towards gay men in the past. And again, remember, this is self-report. This is what people are willing to tell us. Um, so these are some of the actual numbers. And what's actually interesting here um, is that uh, femphobia is coming out as one of the strongest predictors. And so what this is saying here, without getting too, you know, into it for eight at night. Um, is it for, the stem phobia scale went from one to seven. If you were scoring a one, you were pretty low. If you are scoring a seven, you were pretty, you were as high as you could get on our scale. What this is saying is that for every step up on that scale, if you went from a one to a two, or a four to a five, every time you went up one step on that scale, you became 2.6 times more likely to fall into that violent group. For every single step on that scale. So imagine, right, all the way from one to seven, the people at seven are considerably more likely to be in that violent group. Over and above the personalization of prejudice, the narcissism, and then the other three that just fell out of the analysis. If you do the analysis without those, it's not like we have a wonky um, sample. If you take personalization, phobia, and narcissism out of the analysis, those general uh, traditional predictors do work. Right? It's when you're considering them all together that uh, those more traditional ones fall out. So, back to the puzzle. <laughs> Narcissistic environment predicts violence towards gay men only when personalization uh, is high. It disappears when personalization is low, so that live and let live attitude uh, is a good attitude to have. But then femphobia also seems to be predictive here of directed towards the violence towards gay men. It seems to be a key um, key piece of the puzzle in understanding that violence. Uh, so, in terms of the physiology of sexual prejudice, it didn't really support what we were looking for in terms of being able to distinguish that persistently sexually prejudiced group. Are they hanging out in different physiological responses? It doesn't seem like it from what we have. We can't conclusively close the book on that, but we don't see any evidence uh, that, you know, that would support the notion that those who are really taken over and violent are doing so out of control, out of, because they're out of control, because they're being driven by physiological responses. We don't have anything to support that. Um, and so the next place where we're going, and this is, this is my other honor students um, thesis for this year, is the, uh, we're going to look at the facial expressions of the people who were watching those slideshows. So the entire time they were watching the slideshows, and drooling and answering surveys. The webcam was on as well, and it was recording their facial expressions. Uh, and so there's something in social psychology called the ANCODI hypothesis, which stands for anger, contempt, and disgust. 
And when those three particular emotions are high, it predicts violence, specifically within political context. So if you follow um, a political leader and you analyze their speeches over time, you'll see that if, if the emotion words that they're using start to be more anger, contempt, and disgust over time, then you can find that there's going to be violence in the future. The way that they looked at that mostly is going retrospectively in time, and they look at the speeches leading up. And especially three months out from some sort of huge political violent event, you'll see that the leaders of that group have honed in on these three emotions. You take one away, and it doesn't work. You need all three together. The reason being that anger is a motivating emotion. It gets you going. When you're angry, you're willing to do something about it. Uh, contempt gives you that air of superiority. You're looking down. You have the right to intervene when you're feeling contempt. It's your role to step in and, and squash what's going on. And disgust motivates us to get rid of things. And so when you put those three things together, you're motivated to get rid of the things that you look down upon. And so that's why when you see those three, we're wondering if maybe we see those three in the faces of our participants. Might that also predict uh, those who were reporting greater amounts of violence? That's what we're going to look at and see. Um, and luckily, by many lucky strokes, I got the, what was it like, I don't know if it was Boxing Day or the 27th, I got an email saying I have the money to buy the software. Um, so my poor honor students been like sweating it out as to whether or not her thesis is going to have the software that she needs or not. But now that we have the software. Um, and so we got the software, thanks to the American Institute of Bisexuality, they came through. Um, and so that's what we're going to be looking at, is analyzing those facial expressions uh, to see if that tells us anything. We also have heart rate variability data to look, to dig through. Um, we'd like to replicate this in different samples. So because we didn't have a lot of money, um, we had to make it small. and We couldn't have a lot of compounding variables. So we had only white participants. We had pretty, um, you know, standardized, uh, looking photos, right? We didn't stray off and have major deviations in gender presentation in the photos that we showed them. But this would be interesting to see how do women respond to these photos? How do people respond when the two people in the photos look very different in their gender presentation? Uh, all of these different variables would make it more interesting. So varying gender presentation, for example. Uh, what happens when you're looking at female same-sex couples, right? We might expect to see completely different responses. Um, <laughs> um, and then uh, finally, the part that I actually wanted to do originally, but I did this instead first, the part that I really want to get into is what are the health implications of public displays of affection in the first place? What does it mean to hold hands with your partner? Uh, we know that touch is really good for your health and it's really important for you. Uh, but if same-sex couples are experiencing violence or even just have the vigilant fear of potential violence, then maybe they're going to be less likely to hold hands. And if so, are they then not accessing all of the relational and health benefits of the relationship that they're in? Right? Are, they, are they missing out on something? Imagine that you're in a stressful situation and your partner gives you a hug or puts their hand on your back. And imagine that them doing that just made your stress go even higher. You see that, or now who's in the room, what's going on? Most people don't have to think about holding hands, but same sex couples do. And so that could be another factor that explains uh, some of the health discrepancies we see within the population. So we're looking to look at vigilance and health and relationship well-being, and that's the stuff I'm really excited to get into this right So finally, in terms of implications of trying to make you feel like there might be something good out of this, um, <laughs> can we reduce personalization of prejudice? Well, maybe if we could increase empathy, that might be a glory. If we could increase the ability to relate to anybody, then that would be a positive way to, to perhaps change this around. Uh, another one would be, could we just increase acceptance of gender diversity in general, right? And this solves a lot of the problems that society faces right now. If we just be more accepting of feminine men, masculine women, uh, trans identities and queer identities, if we were just more accepting in the first place, then, you know, all upset when a guy's in a skirt or wears eyeliner or, you know, all of these different things, we might not even blink an eye at it in general, across areas, let alone in relationships. Uh, and that applies to all sorts of things, like how I mentioned at the beginning, that you know, female scientists who are more feminine, their research is discounted, they're not taken seriously. Uh, that has nothing to do with same-sex MBA, <coughs> but it might be tied to the same notion of femtophobia. So the glass ceiling, um, you know, like the political, like the, the election between Clinton and Trump, again, you saw that. 
Clinton had to walk a very fine line of, you know, being soft and warm enough, but not being quite too feminine to not be, you know, presidential. A very fine line that she had to kind of teeter walk, and we see that in any political situation where women uh, enter the theater, sphere. So I think there's a lot of area there for Thank you very much. Oh, and one plug. At the bottom there, drkarenblair.com slash ongoing, we have three ongoing studies that are recruiting participants at this time. So we need as many as possible. So if you'd like to do a study, you don't have to be gay. <laughs> <laughs>